I invite you to take your Bible now and turn with me to Acts chapter 9, beginning at verse 1 through 9. Acts 9, 1 through 9. If you've brought your own Bible and prefer to use that, we certainly invite you to do that. But it's a privilege to be together and to read the Word of God. Acts chapter 9, beginning at verse 1, what we are looking at now is the conversion of a man who was one of the greatest enemies of the Christian faith, Saul. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. He was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Apart from our Lord Jesus Christ, no one person has shaped the history of Christianity like the Apostle Paul. He's responsible for giving us 28% of this New Testament. Of the 27 books that comprise the New Testament, he is the author of 14. That is, if you give him the book of Hebrews, which I believe he wrote. But how well do we as modern Christians uh, in the 21st century know this man, Paul? Well, let's begin with a few basic facts about his life. His name in Hebrew, Saul. In Greek, Paul. His race, Jewish. More specifically, a, tri a member of the tribe of Benjamin. His birthplace, Tarsus, the capital of Cilicia in modern-day Turkey. His upbringing, Jerusalem. His education, the school of Hillel. His professor, Gamaliel. His citizenship, Roman, at a time when one to two-thirds of the population within the Roman Empire were slaves, he was a freeman. His religious employment, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. In other words, he was a member of the religious police. His secular employment, he was a tent maker. His zeal, persecuting the church as a dangerous sect that needed to be eliminated. His conversion to the Christian faith, it occurred on the road to Damascus as he was approaching the city to arrest Christians. When? Approximately A.D. 33, when he was about the age of 30. Number of times his conversion is mentioned in the New Testament, three times. Number of times it is alluded to in his own epistles, four times at least. His new mission as assigned by Jesus Christ to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And its significance is this. It paves the way for the gospel to go to the ends of the earth. Not just Jewish people, mind you, but to us, to Gentiles. Now having said that, the major embarrassment of the church in the 21st century in regard to Paul and the New Testament is twofold. First of all, Paul and his writings are neglected in favor of the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Secondly, confusing Paul's ministry to the Gentiles with Peter's ministry to the Jews. When we do that, we conflate kingdom truth pertaining to the Jewish race 
with church truth intended for Gentile Christians like you and me. Let's take a closer look at this remarkable conversion from the persecutor of the church to the apostle of Jesus Christ to us Gentiles. Let's remember that he spoke more about the resurrection of Jesus Christ than any other person in the New Testament. To begin with, let's look at the target of his destructive zeal, his anger. Who were they? They were called the followers of the way. The way seems to have been the derisive name given to the Christian faith by the Jews early on. But the early Christians accepted the taunt not only because John the Baptist fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah who spoke of a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, but also because Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. The early Christians, you see, gladly embraced that self-designation of followers of the way, meaning God's path or the way of salvation. The spirit of Christianity is not any formulated creed, but it is the shared life of Jesus Christ. Anything less than that is not Christianity. Now Luke first introduces us briefly to Paul in chapter 7 at the third incidence of persecution against the early infant Christian church. Stephen, you'll remember, a man full of grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people, uh, but Paul's frenzied uh, persecution of Christians picked up after he met Stephen. He saw a man who knew what he was talking about. He saw a man who was committed to Jesus Christ, and he realized that man could do serious damage, and therefore all Christians could do serious damage. And uh, so the Jews uh, uh, would uh, basically, from the synagogue of the freedmen, various Greek cities and provinces would argue with Stephen, but they were no match for the wisdom uh, that the Holy Spirit gave him as he spoke. These Jews bribed others to falsely accuse Stephen of blasphemy. And so Stephen was arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court. When questioned as to the charges against him, Stephen gave a sermon speech. In fact, it's the longest sermon speech in the entire New Testament. He spoke to the Sanhedrin, indicting the nation for having rejected God's messengers all through the Old Testament uh, centuries, and then finally, for having rejected the Messiah, Jesus Christ, when he came. And at the end of that longest sermon speech in the book uh, of Acts and in the New Testament, Stephen is taken out and stoned to death. But before the stoning, the executioners removed their outer garments for being able to throw the stones, and they laid them at the feet of this man named Saul of Tarsus. To understand Paul's or Saul's antipathy for the early Christians, we have to understand the politics of what's going on. The chief priest and the Sadducees were jealous to maintain their own political power, their official position of leadership over the people. They feared that this Christian sect might very well cause trouble for, with them for Rome. They had no problem of bribing witnesses and using other forms of fraud to stamp out this Christian sect in order to prevent their loss of power, status, and influence with Rome. Meanwhile, Paul himself was a dedicated Pharisee of the strictest sect. He had been taught the law of Moses, and he was zealous toward it. There was no other way to go. He was blameless as touching the righteousness of the law. He was not morally wicked as the high priest and the Sadducees. 
He was simply a legalist, a moralist, and a fanatical religionist. Stephen's martyrdom triggered a new and devastating wave of persecution against the church at Jerusalem, scattering the, all but the apostles. Now, God, interestingly enough, uses such setbacks to advance his gospel. Since Christians fled to escape the persecution in Jerusalem and went to other parts of the Roman Empire, they took with them the good news. They were now doing what they were supposed to do, preach the gospel in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So now what's happening is the salt, Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth, right? The salt is getting out of the salt shaker and it's getting into the world where Jesus intended it to go. It's a great question to stop and ask ourselves, is that happening today? I mean, as a secular society and as government continues to attempt to muzzle Christianity and to stop Christians from speaking out about sin or holding firm to Christ, as in the case with Disney right now in Florida, the question is this, will we crawl into a hole as a frightened groundhog? Or will we become bolder to share the gospel anyway, anywhere, anytime? Now thank God for Governor DeSantis. Pray that he stands strong and others stand with him. And I'll say this along this line, I have personally and sadly witnessed and heard professing Christians remain silent, remain evasive. When they were given a great opportunity, they, they could have stood for the Christian faith. And then they excused their behavior by making a quote like this. See if you recognize where it came from. Discretion is the better part of valor. Well, first of all, Shakespeare said that, and the actual quote goes, the better part of valor is discretion, in the which better part I have saved my life. You hear what Shakespeare is saying? It'd be foolish for you to act in any way other than that which results in saving your own skin. Completely contrary, by the way, to what Jesus said when he said, whoever saves his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. In other words, the Bible calls that cowardice. And in Psalm 15, 4, the psalmist speaks of the blameless life, the man who is living a blameless life, not in man's eyes, but in God's eyes. And he says, this blameless man is the one who despises the vile person, but honors those who fear the Lord. Did you hear what I just said? Despises the vile person. That's right. Let's stop this fake lovey-lovey pretentiousness when evil is blooming all around us. Let's remember that the godly man, the blameless man, keeps an oath even when it hurts him. In other words, it doesn't work out to his advantage, but he still keeps his word. He doesn't change his mind. A Christian is a person who speaks the truth even when it hurts. A Christian is one who fulfills an oath even when the results of doing it and carrying it all the way results in personal loss. Anyone, anyone who takes a stand for Jesus Christ will suffer loss. It may be in terms of friendship, it may be in terms of profit in your business. It may be in terms of privileges that you get. 
It may be in terms of convenience to you or comforts to you, but yea, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It's not a matter of if, it's only a matter of when. In spite of that, we will not compromise God's word to please anyone even if it results in something that goes against our own personal benefit. Stephen declared the word of God fearlessly and he paid with it. He paid for it with his life. He's the model of faithfulness in a culture of infidelity. He exemplifies what the hymn writer said when he wrote, Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Stand up for him. What about it? Is that what the church is doing? Well, what about Paul's destination in particular that day? Why did he select the city of Damascus, one of the oldest inhabited cities of the world, a key commercial city, um, a place where there were several trade routes that came together. It may very well have been that by going to Damascus, Paul had one ambition, to stop Christianity from intersecting with different cultures and spreading to the rest of the world. It might have been that there was a large number of Christians who fled to Damascus to escape the wave of persecution in Jerusalem. Meanwhile, Damascus had a large Jewish population. Paul knew some of them could be relied upon to report the heretical Christians to religious officials like himself. And after securing official letters of extradition for such Christians, he must have had some clearly in his sights, clearly in his crosshairs, and accompanied by others, he set out for that 135 mile trip due north of Jerusalem, a six day trip on foot. And as he neared the city, about noontime, three things happened. These three things sum up the conversion of the Apostle Paul to Jesus Christ. But here's the thing, these three things must happen if any authentic conversion is to be authentic. Now, don't misunderstand. There may not be all of the visual or auditory experiences just as the Apostle Paul had them, but they'll be there. Even though Paul is confronted by the risen Christ, the risen Christ who is declared to be the Son of God with power by his resurrection from the dead, God is abundantly gracious. He is very gentle in the way he handles the Apostle Paul. And we see this in this conversion. We see three elements. What were they? First, there is a light from heaven that flashed around Paul. A light so bright that it blinded him. And that's how he was arrested. Can you imagine? If God required before you would stop, before you would listen to him, he would have to blind you. Well, that's what happened. Now we know as we read the entire account that his sight was eventually restored. This was not permanent blindness, but Paul didn't know that at the time. Every sinner is in the dark, you see, until the light of the gospel shines on him or her. Of their meticulous, Legal righteousness. Jesus said about the scribes and Pharisees, you blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. Then he said, I am come a light into the world, but whosoever believeth on me should not abide or remain in darkness. Now that's the reality. We are in a world of light and darkness. And the human heart has a contrast. There is the darkness of sin 
until you come to the light of Jesus Christ. That's the way it works. There's only two one of two categories all of us are in this morning. We're either in the light or we're in the dark. We're either dead in sin or we're dead to sin. Paul fell to the ground blind. But this was not so much a judgment of God on him, but a symbol of his own spiritual blindness up to now. Jesus, you see, said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. What about the contrast in your life? Is there clearly that distinction? Do you know when you've crossed the line from temptation into sin? That's darkness. Do you know when you fought against temptation and you've crossed the line into light? That's walking with Christ, walking in the spirit so you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There's a light that flashed around Paul. Secondly, Paul heard a voice and the voice spoke audibly and the voice said, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? Now that voice was the risen Christ. And he spoke audibly. Paul heard his name two times expressing the tenderness of Jesus, the pity of Jesus, but also the disapproval of Jesus. The men who were with Paul heard the sounds, but they heard no articulated words. They didn't get it. They didn't get the message. Conversion does not happen without the word of God, this word, and the spirit of God, in other words, the written word and the author, bringing and revealing the application of that word to my personal soul and to your personal soul. That's the only way it can happen. The spirit of God does not promise to use psychology or self-improvement books or philosophical logic to open the door of the sinner's heart. Instead, the Holy Spirit takes the written word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. Jesus asked Paul, why, not why was he persecuting the church, but why was he persecuting Jesus himself? Paul thought he was persecuting and pursuing and eliminating heretics. But he was doing something much worse. He was attacking Jesus Christ personally. You say, well, how could that be? Well, it's very simple. The church is the body of Christ. Attached to the body is the head. Jesus said, I am the head of the church. When anybody lays their hand on the church, they're laying their hand upon Christ. It's an extremely perilous and presumptuous thing to do. I, by the way, have known many people who have done it. Inside the church, as well as from outside the church. And they paid dearly for it. But apparently Paul did this in ignorance. And he asked, who are you, Lord? You see, although Paul is the enemy of Jesus, Jesus is not the enemy of Paul. Here again, we see the gentleness of Jesus Christ, the risen Christ. Jesus said, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. That was not the point but that the world might be saved. That's the point. Paul saw a bright light. Paul heard a voice. Third, Paul's conversion involved a response, obeying a call. Jesus said, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. 
No conversion is authentically Christian if it leaves the person pursuing their own original goals and ambitions. Up to this time, Paul was in the habit of dictating where he was going, when he was going, and what he was going to do. But now all that's changed. Now he is told what to do. And I'm sure many of us don't like the sound of that. And I'm sure there are many who we'd like to see converted, but they don't like the sound of that. But that should concern us because Christian conversion is always marked by submission to the authority of another, and that another is Jesus Christ. It's never me, it's never somebody else speaking, it's always Jesus, that's the authority that I come under. And in recounting his conversion before King Agrippa, Paul expanded on what Jesus actually told him to do that day. And this is what he told King Agrippa that Jesus told him to do. He said, arise, Stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things you have seen, but to all of the things which, in which I will appear to you. Delivering you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they will turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, in order that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. And you know what Paul said to King Agrippa as he told him this? Consequently, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. Now, tragically today, in organized <sighs> denominationalism, I have to be honest, I don't see this happening. I don't see people emphasizing the need for conversion. A lot of things come across my desk as a minister but I'm troubled. I'm not now suggesting that every conversion is going to happen exactly as the Apostle Paul's conversion, but what I am saying is that I do not see the elements there of, uh, that we see in the Apostle Paul's conversion. The light, the voice, and the obedience. Christendom is facing an alarming credibility gap. There's something missing. And it's missing in the church, by the way. Instead of our emphasis being placed where the Apostle Paul placed it in his preaching after he came to Christ, which is repentance toward God and faith toward Jesus Christ, now the church seems to have adapted itself to other social institutions in society committed to soft peddling truth and whitewashing what God calls this generation to confess, repent, and abandon. That concerns me. When that's lost, the church has no more mission. Might as well turn the lights out, lock the doors, let's go. One illustration in closing. One of the most powerful personal evangelists of the 19th century was John Vassar, 1813 to 1878. Vassar grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York, and his family ran a brewery. Following his conversion to Christ, he abandoned beer making for soul winning. And on May 15th, 1850, he was commissioned as an agent for the American Tract Society of New York, taking those gospel tracts and distributing them. Vassar took off across the country, never resting in his mission of selling Christian literature and asking everyone he met 
about their relationship to Jesus Christ. But then something happened one day. He was out in the West traveling. He visited a home where the wife was a praying wife. And uh, she, she had a husband who was an ardent unbeliever, wanted nothing to do with Christianity, wanted nothing to do with God. And she begged Vassar when he came to town if he would be able to give her a Bible. And he gave her one and after a short visit departed. He no sooner had left that home when the husband came in. He saw the Bible on a table and became enraged. He took the Bible in one hand and he went out and grabbed an ax with the other. He hurried out to the woodpile. He laid the Bible on the chopping block and he hacked it in two. Then he went back into the house, threw half of the mutilated Bible in front of his wife on a table and said, you claim a part of all property around here as yours. There's your share of this. Then he took the other half and threw it in his woodshed and closed the door. Months later, on a wet winter day, the husband, wanting to get away from his Christian wife, retreated to the work shed. The time passed slowly. He was bored. He looked around for something to read. And there in the corner, laying on the floor, was the half-mutilated Bible. He picked it up. He began reading. Specifically, he began reading Luke 15 about the prodigal son. He got almost all the way through and guess what? His wife had the other half of how the story ended. He became absorbed in the parable. He read it again and again, but he realized the finish of the story lay with his wife. He crept back into the house. It had been months since this had happened that he chopped the Bible in half. He began quietly searching for the other half of the Bible. He was unable to find it. Finally, he asked his wife where she had hidden it. And she told him. He read the story of the prodigal son from start to finish. Again, again, and again. And in the process, he came home to his heavenly father, just as the prodigal son came came back home. Now here's the gist of it. If you were to review your life up to this point, if you could see all of the parables, and if you could see all of the perils that God led you through, if you could see the gradual way he worked shaping your spiritual education. If you could see and hear the gentle rebukes that he whispered in your, in your ears. If you could see the messages he sent from other people, friends, neighbors, strangers, maybe a child's innocent questions, maybe the compassionate act of a stranger, maybe the mesmerizing glow of the moon on a winter's night, or the warm rays of sunshine coming through a window in the house after a long dark rain. The purpose of it all is the same. God is speaking. He's speaking to you about Jesus Christ. He's saying, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest. He's saying, you must be born again. And as I stand here before you this Sunday, thinking about the conversion of the greatest enemy of the Christian faith, 
I think about a modern one. Many miles away. Trying to destroy a country. Making the lives of people a miserable hell. Could this happen to him? Could Vladimir Putin find Jesus? Maybe not. But Jesus could find Vladimir Putin. And that's all that's important. The power of the gospel. The power of God unto salvation. Let's believe it. Let's be good stewards of it. Let's not keep it to ourselves. Let's proclaim it. Wonderful words of life that it is. And if you've never believed him yourself, open your heart. Let him in. Because the clock is ticking. And I'm not sure, and you're not sure, when God will say, as for this world, Time is over. The lights go out and eternity begins. What could be more important than being ready for that hour? Amen.